Welcome to Top of Mind, the show where we talk to real estate industry insiders and experts about the biggest trends impacting the market today. Enjoy the show. Mike Simonson here. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast. This is where I talk to the smartest leaders, thinkers, and doers in the real estate industry and the broader economy to understand where the world is right now. You know, for a few years now, we've been sharing the latest market data every week in our weekly Altos Research video series. With the Top of Mind podcast, we're looking to add context to the discussion about what's happening in the market from, from the leaders, uh, the a lot of other sources, people who think about the data in the market and all the components. Each week, of course, Altos Research tracks every home for sale in the country. We check all the pricing, all the supply and demand. We do all those analytics and, and the changes in that data, and we make it available to you before you see it in the traditional channels. People desperately need to know what's happening right now in the housing market. The market froze so cold last fall, and suddenly things are changing. Uh, everybody is worried about what happens in 2023, though. And so if you need to communicate about this market to your clients, your buyers and sellers right now, go to altosresearch.com for just free consultation. We can talk about the local market, how you use market data in your business. And speaking of what's happening in the market and whether or not we should be worried about what's coming for 2023, I've got another amazing guest today, Nick Bunker. Nick is the director of North American Economic Research at Indeed.com. He's an expert labor economist with extensive experience at discovering insights in economic data and communicating to them in a variety of audiences. Nick is great in social media, and I really appreciate that. Um, he's also a widely cited labor market commentator. His analysis has been used by the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, NPR, NBC, CBS, and lots of others. Uh, Nick definitely has his pulse on what's happening with the jobs and the economy. And so that's what we're going to focus on today and really thinking about how the changes in the, the economic scenario and the job scenario really impact us for 2023. So Nick, welcome. Mike, thanks for having me. All right. Let's, um, let's start with, uh, tell us a little bit about Indeed and your role there. So we get a little we get a little background. Yeah, sure. So uh, indeed, hopefully folks know it. It's, uh, you know, the world leader in, in job search. Um, it's a hiring platform that um, is widely used. And so my role is that I am part of the hiring lab, which is Indeed's team of global labor uh, researchers. So it's a team of economists, data scientists, uh, other researchers who use data from Indeed, but also data from elsewhere to help shine lights on what's happening in the global labor markets. So, uh, you know, you mentioned my title. I, um, I'm the director for the North America, so that's the U.S. and Canada, but we have economists and researchers um, across the globe. Uh, we have folks in Europe, uh, France, Germany, the U.K., but we also have economists in Australia and Japan, so if you have any interest there. But obviously, cool. I think the focus is uh, here in the U.S. Uh, for our conversation. So um, a lot of what we do is, you know, looking into Indeed data, and, and you're talking about uh, what you all do with sort of the weekly updates and where in a similar line of business, at least when it comes to job postings. So one of the things that folks may know our research for is that we, on a, on a weekly cadence, sort of um, release data on the amount of job postings on Indeed um, across those markets and by geographic range. So we are both researchers and providers of essentially real-time labor market data. Yeah. That, and and that's really like why well, I was looking forward to this conversation today. You know, jobs and the job market are seem like a pivotal factor for what happens to housing this year. Like we are the housing slowed way down last fall. Um there are lots of recession fears. But one of the the elements the 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 counter arguments about a recession fear and really about you know how how far does does housing fall? How cold can it get? Is the fact that everybody in the country is like we're still really well employed, right? It's it's you know late January um, when we're recording this, and jobs are still super strong. 
And and so what should give me the overview of like what should I think about employment in a, in a broad sense and really 2023? Like how do, how should I be thinking about that? So it's it's funny when you said the housing market really froze up last fall. Um, you know, to extend that temperature metaphor, labor market has cooled a little bit from where it was, say, late 2021, early 2022, but still hot. It's like the temperature dropped from 105 down to 98 degrees. Yeah, things are still quite strong. I yeah. think there's a variety of metrics you can look at to understand that way. I think the first thing is you know, unemployment rate. It's three and a half percent, which is the same level that we saw back in late 2019, early 2020. So I think that's holding up. And it's essentially been at that level or a few tenths of percentage point above that since the middle of last year. And there's been you know, sort of, if anything, it's popped up a little bit and then trended back down. But I also think the number that is astounding is not only is the unemployment rate 3.5%, but the employers keep adding jobs at very elevated levels. We saw say the average monthly payroll gains, it slowed down throughout 2022. Um, and we'll, some of that data will get revised in the next jobs report, but it's still growing at a pace well above what you need just to keep up with the population. So that, that's a sign that like there's really strong demand. And you can see that in data like job postings on Indeed, where they have come down from where they were a year ago. You know, the latest data that we have is through uh, last Friday, which in this case is um, January 20th that job postings are down around around 10% year on year. But if you look at the, the level compared to where it was on February 1st, 2020, so sort of a, a rough pre-pandemic baseline, it's still up more than 40%. So demand is still quite elevated. And you can see this in government data too, which um, is lagging, but the number of job openings, uh, if you look at the ratio of, of job openings to unemployed workers, there's about 1.7, which is high on space, but then consider that prior to the pandemic, it was about 1.2. So it's still very elevated. And oh yeah, wage growth, at least before inflation, still pretty rapid, even if it's coming down. So this is a hot labor market. One, it's moderating a bit, but there's still lots of strength. So I have so many questions to go like right from there. Uh, maybe the first question that, that the top question that comes to mind is, is, you know, I'm in San Francisco. I run a tech company in San Francisco. The yes. headlines, you know, are layoffs, 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 layoffs every day. How does that factor in to the hot labor market and the numbers that you're talking about? Yeah. So I think that that is a description that hot, the, you know, the temperature in, say, the tech labor market, and particularly in San Francisco, things have dropped more there. Um, you all are, uh, you know, used to chilly chillier peers and maybe other parts of the country. I say that uh, uh, speaking here from Florida. Um, so there's there's definitely some you know, uh, climactic differences here in the labor market. And I think when you're looking at what's happening with the tech sector, again, I think it's useful to think about you know the last few months and then shifting the baseline a little bit. My read of what happened is, has happened in the tech sector is that they hired like gangbusters um, through most of 20, 2021 into 2022. And now there's a reevaluation re going on. So we actually saw this in Indeed job postings before the layoffs started. When you started hearing rumblings about hiring freezes, you could see job postings for software development positions. Um, they started to trend down. And then sort of, and that's a lot of times you see you know, labor market, labor markets start to cool down uh, or sectors cool down. It's sort of hiring goes first and then layoffs happen. And we could see that May of last year, April, May, the tech, jo those job postings, which for the most part, software developers tend to work at tech companies, that slowed down first. But I think what we're seeing now in the layoffs that these large tech companies aren't representative of what we're seeing in the overall US economy. I think if you look at the aggregate statistics of, of layoffs in the US, not only are they low, they are so low that um, let, let me put it this way. So the latest data we have on the layoff data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics is the end of November. Um, November was the 21st straight month that the layoff rate was below its all-time low prior to the pandemic. So we've almost had two years of extraordinary low, low layoffs. And those okay. rates are still very so, low for like leisure and hospitality. Right. So even though we have layoffs in, in tech, the overall total number of layoffs is still is still 
near record lows. Yeah, it, it's either, it is. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, if it if last if November had happened prior to the pandemic, it would have been the all time low. All time low, and and ma- you know maybe we have a few more post November. Yeah, but but we're still not that many more, right? So we're still near record lows, maybe record lows prior pre yeah. pandemic. Wow. Um, okay, so um, then the next question I have is. Uh, is about um, leading data. So does Mm -hmm. tech, do the tech layoffs potentially lead the rest of the market? And or, uh, and then then the corollary is then, uh, uh, you know, even if they don't, like, you know, is there, um, you know, is there like, we have some leading indicators now on job postings, broader market maybe that like, can then if you said our our job postings peaked in May of last year, May like in the tech side, right? And we could then see layoffs starting November, December, January, uh, maybe a six month, seven month lead time from job postings to layoffs. Is that is that so a I don't know a useful rule? I don't of know thumb? if that's like a I don't know if that's like an ironclad like law or anything okay. like that, but I do think there in, in you see this in say the aggregate U.S. labor market that it is high. It's when the unemployment rate starts to creep up. At first, it's because there's just reduced hiring, yeah. and then once layoffs start happening, that's when things really escalate. And what we've seen, so I guess to answer the first part is I don't think what we're seeing now in the tech sector is necessarily, you know, it's not representative of, of overall labor market. And I don't think it's a leading indicator either. I think okay. some of the sectors, some of, you know, some of the forces that are leading to these pullbacks, uh, the pullback retrenchment reductions, however you want to put it for the tech sector, yep. aren't the same thing that you're seeing in other parts of the economy, and particularly industries that tend to, that actually do employ far more workers. I think an expansive definition of the tech sector employment is about 2% of total employment. Um, and think about, say, healthcare, which is closer to a sixth of all employment. The dynamics uh-huh. are really different. Tech hired a ton. But then you think about all the stories you read about the constrained hiring for healthcare or education or bars and restaurants, leisure and hospitality, or even retail at certain points. If anything, those industries, they're still you know, it's constrained. They're still looking to hire. They still have elevated rates of turnover. So that's not the experience of your tech or um, even, you know, some one sector we are seeing some retrenchment in too is like, say, like transportation and warehousing because everything, everyone's getting stuff ordered to their house. Yep. They're still like trying to catch up to where they were pre pandemic. There's still demand there. And also, household spending is still, you know, looks to be rotating still back towards in person services spending. So there's some forward momentum there as well. I see. Okay, that's really cool. Okay, so tech is only two percent of the jobs. Like even it just it just you know what a surprise it just takes up the headlines, right? Like the it's it's very noticeable, but it's not actually that many jobs. Yeah, it's the uh, um, a lot of these like tech giants. Their share of uh, the stock market's much 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 larger than the share. Of- right, right, right. Oh wow, that's really fascinating. Um, uh, then, then, uh, okay. So then, you know, what I'm trying to get my head around is, so it's January jobs look great or, or almost great in most sectors. Jobs are, are hot. So, um, how long does that last? So uh, at some point we have a cycle, some mm-hmm. point we go, go through, um, is it too early or like to say that is it too early to say that 2023 uh, is like, can we have a jobs recession in 2023? Or can we, or is there signals that give us confidence? How fast can it turn? Yeah. So I think um, there's it, there's definitely a possibility of, of a jobs recession this year, for sure. I think, in fact, if you look at, say, surveys of economists, it's roughly 50-50 right now about pe- the chair that think that well, the U.S. will enter a recession this year versus those who don't. Uh, I think part of the narrative that 
part of the story, war part of the stories in which the U.S. does not enter recession is because of the continued strength of the U.S. labor market. Um, but there's there's definitely a possibility. I think um, one you know force that could lead us there is just the federal uh, as sort of folks in the housing space, space well know, uh, the Federal Reserve did a lot of hiking last year. Um, and those effects are um, still working their way through the economy. So I think that's definitely a possibility that that's a big constraint uh, on the U.S. economy, continues to slow things down with the background of, you know, a labor market is still hot, but is, you know, the temperature has come down a little bit. There are signs of moderation and there are some leading indicators that are, you know, slowing down. I don't think they're necessarily, you know, they're sort of they're blinking yellow lights and not blinking red lights right now. Um, so there are some signs there that things are cooling down it's or slowing down, but it's just that in 2022, things were moving very rapidly. So it might take some time um, for things to stop um, or uh, to maybe stop tor- torturing this metaphor for, for us to tip into a recession. Yeah, okay. So uh, that's really, really useful framework. So things are st- things are still hot. There are some signals, obviously, uh, some of the sectors we can see slowing down, uh, but in general, you know, because employment is still and and the the uh, the total number of job availability is still at record levels. Uh, we have we've got some momentum for to 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 before that can change before that would shift to unemployment spiking to a scary number. Is that right? Correct. And, yeah, and there's clearly underlying momentum. Yep, there is underlying momentum in our favor still at this point. In in after you know, ten percent done, uh, you know, fourteen percent done with the the or eight eight percent done with the year, right? Like we're almost almost mm-hmm. done with that. Um, so uh, so then the question is to that that I'm uh, so uh, the the quick sidebar is what's your take on recession coming this year? Yeah, so I think. Uh, I mentioned the Federal Reserve earlier. I do think my view is uh, it depends a lot on how the Federal Reserve uh, thinks they're doing. Um, that if, I, like I said, there are signs of moderation. So earlier I mentioned wage growth is still strong. Um, the story depends a little bit on what metric you're looking at, but there are signs that the wage growth is is moderating and is coming down from these really elevated levels down to where they were, you know, they're, they're normalizing. They're in closer to what we've seen back in, say, 2019, which was still a hot labor market, but not, you know, the 105 degree temperature we saw in, say, as far as 2022. And now the Fed right now is really concerned about wage growth because they think that's a potential source uh, or uh, you know, more fuel for inflation. So if that starts to moderate, then maybe the Fed starts to think, okay, hey, like, we can really back off. We don't need to hike more. And I think that will make me feel... Um, more confident about the chances of, uh, you know, that would diminish the my probability of recession happening this, later this year, just because the parts of the economy that are more sensitive to the interest rates, they won't have less sort of pain inflicted on, they'll have less pain inflicted on them. So there'll be less need to shed workers. There'll be more sort of growth in sort of household income, which can sustain consumption, which is the major source of economic growth in the US. Uh, okay. And, and, uh, do you look at speaking of rates? Do you, do you look at the yield curve and use that as a, uh, like the yield curve says recession? What do you think of that? So, yeah. So, uh, I'll caveat this with like, I'm not a, like a forecaster at all, but I do think there's a bunch of different leading indicators and not in the, the yield curve is definitely one that is, um, among, a variety in sort of the financial sector that are like, they are blinking red lights for sure. Um, and I think um, my view is that there have been a lot of, uh, you know, solid rules of thumb or like uh, guidelines for how to understand the U.S. economy. Um, and then around the spring of 2020, they all stopped working. <laughs> um, and it is it is probably, uh, it's famous last words in economics to say this time is different. Um, but I, uh, I hesitate to say that there are like ironclad rules anymore after everything we've seen over the now almost three years. Yeah. I, I, I think about that too. The, the, it could very well be that the, you know, we have bullwhip effects in all of these demand and, and, 
lumber prices up and down and and we had you know we had in the housing markets insanity and then super cold in the same year and yeah. and so like how do you like the the normal rules of thumb are out of like it could very well be that the bond market is still trying to absorb the crazy bullwhip effects of the pandemic economy and and therefore that actually yeah interest yeah. okay um well so um you know and one of the risks i'm <laughs> excuse me worried about is um is that housing now in january is actually coming in stronger than i expected and hmm. prices are stronger and indicators of demand are stronger and uh you know where if if the Fed is looking at wage growth starting to subside and feeling like their rate hikes have done enough, they've also been using housing as a as a metric. And if housing is not subsiding, does that mean that housing forces uh, the Fed to to keep raising and keep the throttle on down on on the rest of the economy? Yeah, and I think that that is. Uh... I've been thinking. I've been thinking about that for the broader economy as well. You know, we're we're talking the day before the Q4 GDP numbers come out, and there's some expectation that 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 number could be like fairly robust, or it's like that the economy continues at least sort of GDP has still some substantial, substantial momentum there, and um, you know, one of the good signs of the past few months has been that inflation is moderating. Um, so it's wage growth, but. It looks like inflation is moderating more than wage growth right now, which means more people are getting inflation-adjusted raises, which is which is great news. But also, that means there's more like economic strength there. Um, there's more real income growth, so that's potentially more consumption. So then the question is, you know, does the Fed get spooked by stronger economic growth, or is it just in sort of react preemptively because it, it, it's afraid that will like fuel inflation more, or does it just say okay? Well, let's actually just keep an eye on inflation itself and see if that can moderate while there's underlying economic growth. From what they've said, they seem to think that they need you know, below um, sort of below trend growth in order to moderate inflation. So the question is, you know, do they stick to that or do they say, hey, well, you know, who are you going to trust your sort of um, your your uh, DSG models or your eyes and you can see the inflation data? Yeah, interesting. Okay, that brings up a great point that I'm interested in. Housing, so housing affordability, right? Affordability has been a big, big challenge. We had home prices spiked way up, and then mortgage rates climbed, and so now the payments are significantly higher than they were, uh, you know, than they've ever been. Right? It's it's a, affordability is a challenge. One of the ways we mitigate affordability challenges is with wage growth, and with wage growth that outpaces inflation uh it, it it has wage growth been behind inflation is it getting ahead what, is is that going to help housing or is it is it going to get worse for for home buyers like who are looking around the world yeah so i think for business and inflation really kicked off in the spring of 2021 i um, mean also when wage growth started kicking off on average most most uh, you know on average Inflation has grown faster than, than wage growth. Um, there's been this period where, by variety of metrics, we've seen wage growth at at levels of, above sort of anything we've seen over two decades, multi-decade highs. But inflation has been even, you know, it has it's the highest been since the late seventies, early eighties, um, and they've both started to moderate. It's just that inflation looks like it's moderating more. Um, and I think the question is, uh, it's sort of a uh, it's a it's a race between inflation, between prices and wages, which one's going to slow down more first. Um, and right now, um, it does look like inflation's falling faster. Now, part of that is energy prices, um, which have come down quite a bit. Um, so maybe that they're sort of, uh, it falls faster and then wages, um, you know, then it's like the next chunk, which falls faster after that period. Um, but there is, you know, the possibility that we have a period where nominal wage growth moderates, slows down, but inflation just falls faster. So we have, you know, again, continued underlying momentum where there's strong enough demand to keep the labor market tight. 
um, while inflation moderates. So I think we were talking earlier about headlines, about you know tech has a lot of headlines. Um, a story that came out yesterday was that Walmart has announced that it's raising its starting wages from uh, from twelve dollars to fourteen. That's you know far more people work at Walmart than work at say Meta or Amazon or Meta or um, uh, you know Google. Um, there's it's going to affect more folks, and also it's reflective of labor market trends for the kinds of you know industries or uh, workers who who work at Walmart, which are far more people. Uh, and I said, you know, on average, inflation has outpaced wages. Actually, it's the lower end of the wage distribution seeing more real wage gains. It's that middle to higher part that's lag behind. And if we start to see inflation come down, then it'll actually be more people see real wage, real wage gain. More people. So there's a, there is uh, there's a, a decent chance that this year that more of the population sees real wage gains. Is that a good way to summarize that? Summarize that? There is. Okay. There is. Um, although it's interesting that, you know, in during the, at the start of the pandemic, you know, we had big unemployment, but the people who were unemployed uh, at the time, it was, you know, it didn't stop the housing market at all because the the people who were unemployed were, were the, the, the low salary uh, service workers who are already locked out of the housing market, the home mm-hmm. purchase market. And so yep. those folks are are now the ones really seeing the most gains. Is that true? Yeah, that is. It is the you know uh, the sectors that have seen the fastest wage growth have been you know, bars, restaurants, retail, um, hotels, which is lower in the distribution. Um, and they've actually seen for many for many workers in those industries, wage growth has outpaced. Um, it's it is the it is um, you know. It's wage growth at the middle of the top that actually has been you know, not as robust. So it's actually been a period of declining wage inequality where just it's right. been faster at the bottom. So, um, but yeah, when you, of course, when you think about the housing market, it's the folks most likely to buy who have been the ones who've seen a bigger hit or constraint um, on their real inc- uh, real earnings um, because their wage growth hasn't been as strong. So that that is sort of like we can see the current trends in wages uh, is probably not providing much tailwind for housing, but probably better for the fabric of society. Like potentially, 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 yes. Yeah. We, if, uh, okay. Well, I'll take that as a win. <laughs> yes, I think I think in the in the realm of um, you know back in twenty nineteen, I think there was. You could see signs of this was starting to happen. That lower wage growth was like picking up. Pre-pandemic, was, uh, there pre-pandemic. So say 2019, 2018, Labor market was tight enough. Lower wage workers, lower wage industries, wage growth was picking up, and it was you know a very positive development. Uh, which inequality coming down and sort of the pandemic hit, and the initial shock was, oh boy, this is going to undo all the progress that came there. But just because of the way the sort of uh, you know the whiplash nature of the labor market. And especially in 2021, with everything reopening, actually gave those workers sort of bargaining power, increased competition for them. And now it's sort of, we're seeing wage gains per se, um, the combination of food services, which is you know, bars and restaurants, that if you told me in 2019, that was you know the wage gains we're seeing now, which is moderated from where they were in 2021. I've been like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. What happened? Um, and then I would fill my past, past self in. I'd be a bit horrified. Yeah. Uh, all right. That is really great information for me. That's very helpful for me to understand the trends for the year. I have a couple other things that I'm very interested in with related to housing and labor markets. The big trend, of course, of the last few years is the the remote work uh, phenomenon. Uh, do you have a, a view? Do you have, do you have data on, on that, maybe from Indeed, that that impacts that, that you have a view uh, and then do you have a, a view about longer term trends as well i'm interested in both of those from you yeah so i think uh the short answer on remote work is it, it's here to stay um now it might not take the it's definitely not going to take the form uh that say many people got introduced to remote work which is spring 2020 um working from your kitchen table um but i think that what we've seen so far is that this is an enduring trend um some of my colleagues did research um, looking at the trends in the share of job postings on Indeed that sort of are advertising remote work. 
um, looked at that across 20 different countries. So these are all higher income countries um, and looked at basically what the trends were. And so, you know, 2019, early 2020, relatively low. Pandemic hits, lockdowns happen, all those restrictions put on, um, jumps up as employers have to say, okay, like we can hire people, but it needs to be done remotely. And then those restrictions slowly get taken off. It, it, the timing varies by country, location, but as they're taken away, the share of job postings really doesn't drop that much. Um, it's elevated. Uh, you know, we continue to track this. So in the US, um, the share of job postings that advertise remote work, place data we have, it's still 3x what it was back in, say, um, 2019. So it's still almost, you know, it's more than three times. I think it's three and a half times higher now than it was pre pandemic. Now, of course, there's huge uh, uh, variation in the kinds of jobs that you done remotely. Software development jobs, about 40% of those advertise remote work, um, which makes sense. Those are the kind of jobs that you can, you can sort of do with the laptop and uh, an electrical outlet. Um, there are uh, uh, all the software programmers out there are like, I think I need a little bit more than that, but you know, I'm going to call on some hand waving here. But then there are other jobs which just requires you to have face to face contact. Um, and most jobs do require face to face contact. So it's somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to 40, maybe 45% of jobs can be done remotely. Um, but what we found is that a lot of jobs that could be done remotely, sort of technologically, but weren't before, people found that they like that. So it does look like it's going to stick around. Um, it works. Employers have found it works. You know, some of them maybe begrudgingly admitting that. Um, and job seekers definitely are really interested in it because um, you know, we can also see searches on Indeed, and it's about somewhere in the vicinity of nine to ten percent of all searches on the Indeed platform contain words related to remote work. So there's That's- strong job seeker appetite, and employer demand for it has stayed elevated as well. So 10% of job searchers are like looking for that as sort of a requirement of their work. Yeah. Or at least testing the grounds to see, okay, what can I get yeah. if I have just look for remote? Uh, 10, 10% is actually lighter than I would have expected. Like I would have expected that sort of like everybody's at least first going for that. Uh, is that? Yeah. I, I would say it is. There's, you can imagine. Maybe that's my tech phone. Like mo- I think it's that, but I also think that it is the, if you think about the search process. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I you can imagine someone just saying, "I just want a remote job," typing in remote. You can also imagine someone saying, "I want an economist job," searching economist, and then the first thing they do whenever a job is be like, "Does this have remote? Does this have remote? Does this have yeah. remote?" Not yeah. okay. I'm not interested. So I think it's just a matter of how the how how what at what stage people are filtering for remote work. Sure, fair enough, search. fair enough. But but the initial search, ten percent of them are looking. It, like the the which would imply that's like the first thing I want is a remote job. The next thing I, I want is what's that job do? What is my responsibilities? That's that, okay. So in that sense, that that's actually a lot, right? Yeah, and that's especially because pre-pandemic it was closer to like two two and a half percent. So it's right, jumped right. a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. That that's cool. And do you guys have data on uh, like salary impl- implications of that of being remote? Like, so we don't, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. I was going to say like, you know, the, like, you know, the, if you're working for Google, are you, are, you know, like there's some talk about, do you get your salary, you get your Silicon, your San Francisco salary if you live in, you know, Omaha? Yeah. So I think there is, I think that is, that's the territory. I think that like the labor market employers, job seekers and researchers are still figuring out is remote encompasses you know, again, uh, characterizing here, like sort of two forms of remote work. There's fully remote, which is you live, say there's, you live wherever you want inside the United States of America, but your employer is based anywhere else or hybrid, which is you live in the same, you live within a commuting distance of your job, but you are required to go in certain days. So there in the case where the job can be done is a hybrid remote form. You're still in, you're still tethered to sort of local labor markets. So you're, if you're in, say, say your company's based um, in Boston, sort of your wages are going to be still dictated really, roughly by what's happening in the Boston market, other employers, that labor market. But if you're available anywhere in the US, then that's when you start to get like a national labor market so that if competition starts is, you know, 
it turns out the competition with the national labor market is equivalent to like what you, the wages you would have gotten in San Francisco, then it doesn't matter if you live in Omaha, you can still get those prices. Now, there's, it's unclear how many of those jobs right now are fully remote in the sense of like you can live wherever versus how many are still, it's, um, you know, you're still going into the office one or two days a week. So there's still that, it's so sort of remote more of a spectrum rather than I, I, I'm anywhere or I'm in an office five days a week. Yeah. Do you have a, uh, do you have a, a view to tie this back to our, our recession and our employment, um, uh, discussion earlier? Do you have a view? It is as we have people more remote, more work from home, uh, does that give the, the job market more or less resiliency? Like, is that pro cyclical or is it counter cyclical? Mm. Do you like, so pro cyclical in my mind would be like, oh, well, Joe lives in Omaha. Let's cut Joe first and let's cut them faster than the people who I'm working with. Maybe it's counter cyclical though. It's like, oh, Joe's a lot less expensive. So we don't have to cut it. I don't know. Like what, what do you have a view? Is there any data on that yet? Or do you have a, an opinion even? Uh, yeah. So I think that uh, we, we haven't experienced a downturn yet with like uh, systematic um, or like uh, highly utilized remote work. So I think, um, when that happens and hopefully it's, hopefully it's a while from now, um, we'll, we'll find out. But I do think it, it does, um, I think remote work can have, um, it can help the bottom line in a variety of ways. One, you know, hey, Joe works in Omaha. Um, he's not as expensive, but also, hey, um, uh, Larry and Fred only come into the office three or uh, two days a week. So it's a three, even though we're hybrid, maybe we can use less office space. Um, so you can save that way. So like there's other margins you can downgrade right. on to save costs. Um, or even, um, uh, hey, uh, we're going through a tough period. We're just going to stop using office. We're going to like end our lease. You're all like temporarily fully remote. Or you can make that margin where it's like, okay, we don't have to use the office space anymore. There's maybe less overhead that way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sort of unclear. Um, you know, maybe there's also, it is, you hire someone in the national market and then you realize like, maybe we haven't been getting so much out of Joe. Maybe he's even, yes, he's worth less, but maybe he's not, maybe, sorry, maybe he's less expensive, but maybe the the value proposition isn't there quite yet. Um, it's unclear to me how it shakes out. How it shakes out. Yeah. Uh, my gut says it's, it's probably adds to the resiliency of uh, companies. Like it adds, it adds strength. Uh, cost savings and stuff, and, and therefore is counter cyclical. Helps mm-hmm. my gut says that, but I'm really interested to see if we we get some data that that shows that to be yeah. true. So the one data thing I will note is that it's not quite an outright recession, but obviously the tech sector has pulled a lot back, pulled back quite a bit on the hiring front. Um, but in our data, we're looking not only just at the share of all postings that advertise remote work, but it's also say the different sort of job categories. So while software development jobs, for example, have like really pulled back, if you look at the share of job postings in that sector, that like the remote share of those job postings, it's actually stayed fairly consistent. So it actually looks like as employers just be like, okay, we're going to do less hiring of people, but we're, they're not pulling back on the um, usage or advertisement of remote work, which suggests that, hey, they're pulling back, but either the labor market's still tight enough where we need to use this to appeal to people or we're still bought into it that even if we're pulling back, laying people off, we um, are going to keep it. We're going to keep remote work around. Interesting. And it could be that like, I'm going to lay off these people and the in San Francisco and the people I'm going to hire are going to be in lower cost parts of the country to backfill it. Potentially. Or, or just that um, we're going to let go of these people because they are part of that. A business line that or, that or a function that we don't need anymore um and then we can and we'll keep these folks around in the metro area but like we're also like maybe you can cut back on some of this office spending or just like we know we need um to keep remote work around in order to not lose them to another employer another industry another yeah. competitor that's uh I, okay i appreciate that the, and and so implications for housing then you know feel like we w- we know that the tr- the trend does feel like it's here to stay. Uh, it feels like it is across the economy and and um, 
Uh, though the part of the trend is the hybrid trend that you, you mentioned. It's a spectrum. It's not fully remote. And if I've got to be in the office, you know, one or two days a week, that gives me a, a bigger radius around San Francisco. But it doesn't give me it, it, so that implies the exurbs uh, have more opportunity than uh, th- than like a fully remote, um, like moving to, you know, Hawaii during the like you know or 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 whitefish montana that uh you know people they bought a ranch and moved out of new york city um yeah does that yeah seem like you're and i think that that's we we're, we've seen evidence that that has happened um there's some research on uh, uh, uh nick plume who's an economist at, at stanford has done amazing research on remote work um what he called the donut effect that like actually you've seen housing prices like further out from metro centers, go out faster. Um, again, that is sort of the shifts in labor market, sort of the advent of remote work, particularly hybrid. It's really shifted sort of within metro trends rather than cross metro trends. Um, ah, that people, yeah. if if you, it's in some ways it's sort of uh, if you're going to go into the office and you have like a set amount of time you want to spend on commuting, if you only have to go in two or three days a week, or one or two days a week. Hey, what's a longer commute if I'm only doing it once or twice a week as opposed to five days a week? I, I, I know I just personally talking to folks who are buying a house, they're like, oh, my commute would be X so long. But then if like they have a remote job, they're like, eh, but I'm not going to do it as much. So actually, like my commute time isn't as much as I thought. So I think that it's sort of so far, the form of remote work we've seen so far, which seems to be predominantly hybrid, it's more within in a metro area. Within the metro. Okay. That that is terrific. I may um, uh, love to talk to Nick Plume uh, on that topic. Uh, let's. Um, are there other signals in the Indeed data that 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 are saying something cool that are interesting? Anything counter to the headlines or the zeitgeist? What, what you know? Anything that that you have? So I wouldn't say anything counter. I would say something uh, that I think is interesting. We've released relatively new. Um, I think this goes back to a story we were talking about earlier, is we now have what we're calling the Indeed Wage Tracker, which is we are sh- tracking what has happened to the growth in wages or salaries advertised in job listings or job postings on Indeed. So it's like our measure of wage growth. And the reason why I think it's it's interesting is, is two, is one is that uh, sort of the salaries or wages that are advertised in job postings you imagine that's the sort of thing that is going to lead other wage metrics because it's, you know, what is the cost of hiring someone right now, like a new hire, marginal hire, as opposed to other measures of wage growth that you get from official statistics, which are, you know, what's happened to wage growth for people who've been at the company for five years, people who've been at the company for one year, new hires, someone who just got unemployed, was employed and just got a new job, sort of confounds that. And this can give you hopefully potentially some signal of what's happening um, before for, you know, in the most, the market that's most sensitive to the health of the labor market, which is new hires. And so it's that potential. And what we've seen in fact is that um, our the Indeed wage tracker data really jumped in 2021 and seems to have peaked in 2022, March of, March of last year at about 9%, but it's been coming down since then. And now it's closer to 6.3%. So it's sort of all these wage growth measures jumped in 2021 and um, the, sort of the spring when the economy reopened. Um, our data jumped more, but it started moderating. And it moderated about three to six months before the other measures did. And now they're starting to trend down. And we're seeing continued moderation. So I think it's relevant for you know, household income growth, that there's some moderation there. Um, but I think it is a, a similar story to what we were talking earlier that it's these lower wage in person jobs that saw really strong growth and are moderating now. Um, and it's that the higher end jobs have seen lower growth um, than the low wage jobs, but they're still elevated to what they were, say, back in 2019. So I, I, I think that's a, a new and interesting thing that's, that's come out from us. Sure. And, and uh, anything that we can read in real time that leads the the numbers that we're used to, the headline numbers that we're used to is, I think, really powerful. 
Do you find? Yeah, and I think it's. Oh, sorry. I was going to say. Uh, do you find that uh, is it is it uh, easy or is it difficult to to correlate to to like get the correlation to the the predictive of the of the headlines that are going to be announced? Yeah, so I think it is um, one thing that we often think about when we're like building these projects is, you know, we, we want to make sure there's like representative as possible of the overall labor market. Um, you know, when we, you know, our job postings data, which we release weekly, but our job postings index, wage tracker, where it's like, okay, um, one of the benefits of working at is we have all this tremendous data, um, but also, you know, going in, make, doing our due diligence and all that stuff. And the nice thing is that, is representative. We are seeing our data essentially track, you know, in sort of our job postings index was really like a sprint project that happened in the spring of 2020 to be like, hey, the economy appears to be falling apart. We should try to track this stuff. And what we've seen is that our data tracks fairly well with the official statistics on, say, job openings, which the government books out. Sometimes our data is almost two months ahead of that. So it's been encouraging to see, you know, on the job postings, you know, job openings front that, um, you know, uh, we're speaking the 25th of January. Next week, we'll get the data for the end of December. I've got data for almost the end of January. For the most part, it does look like it's a leading indicator. So I think, um, you know, we do our due diligence, but it's been, um, but then, you know, we, we test it by putting it out there, um, you know, being transparent about what we're checking. And it's been gratifying to see that it matches up with what other uh, other people are seeing in their data. That's really, really terrific. Given all that and the stuff that you can see now and and the the stuff that we're anticipating coming out, GDP numbers and and a, and a year employment numbers and things like that, uh, what are you what are you excited about or looking for to to inform your view of the year? So I think uh, there's uh, two so there's, there's there's three big like labor market specific releases I'm looking at, and there's sort of Three, I guess there's three things I'm honing in on each of them. Um, so, uh, first up, sort of chronologically, is um, to return to wage growth. There's this uh, measure from the uh, BLS called the Employment Cost Index, which is you know a measure that it accounts for the changing sort of composition of the labor market from both like occupations, industries, um, sort of um, you know it's at least I consider like the highest quality wage growth measure. Um, and the Fed has really been harping on this is something we're going to watch um, to understand the state of wage growth. And this is data for the fourth quarter of 2022. The Q3 data showed some moderation, um, some slowdown there. So I think seeing how, def- you know, does that continue? Is there clear definitive cool down there? Uh, and then we're getting the with, uh, job openings and labor turnover survey, um, which is that uh, economic release that has those job openings numbers but the number I'm looking out for is the quits rate. So it's the share of people voluntarily leaving their job. That's one that tend, that's a statistic that um, correlates well with wage growth. Just so you think about people leaving their jobs, for the most part, they're taking new jobs. And the way they get convinced to take a new job most of the time is a uh, higher wage. Um, so if that number, it's come down a little bit um, from 2021 highs, but it's moderated a little bit. So if that number stays up, might see some stronger wage growth. And then uh, we'll get the jobs report, uh, which is like that the, the the big one, the big Kahuna, um, uh, uh, next Friday for us. And that I'll be keeping an eye on what's happening um, to sort of the pace of job gains in leisure and hospitality, which is you know the very constrained sector um, that has been in sort of the um, you know it dropped tremendously during the pandemic. The early days of the pandemic has bounced back. Is still below pre-pandemic levels. So if there's, you know, if, if restaurants and bars are still adding workers, if there's still some strong momentum there, I think that's a sign that, you know, consumers are maybe still spending, but just less on goods and more on going out to eat. And that suggests, you know, more underlying strength um, from the American consumer, which could continue to power economic growth. So uh, that's that's a nice insight. So I should pay attention to leisure and hospitality hiring in in, in the next uh what week or so, whenever that comes out. Uh, mm-hmm. And to know that if that's strong, that is uh, maybe another positive signal for avoiding recession this year. Would that be a, would, would you, would you characterize it that way? I would in that, I think for two reasons. One, if there is continued strength there, that means employers think there's going to be 
you know, continued demand for what are you know, leisure services. It's right there in the name. Um, and it's sort of discretionary spending, but also that if those folks um, continue, if folks in the industry keep getting employed, that's, you know, that's more wage growth, more employment growth, more income growth in the economy, which, you know, has that um, reinforcing cycle, more employment for people who tend to spend more of their money. So that can ripple out. Uh, re- terrific, terrific, terrific. Um, this has been really great. And we just powered through almost an hour really, really fast. Do you, uh, so let's make sure people can follow you and your research and stuff. Where do, where do we, where do we go? Yeah. So if you're interested in uh, Hiring Labs research, you can go to hiringlab.org. Um, and if you want to download any of the job postings that I mentioned, you just go to hiringlab.org slash data. Easy to remember. Um, if you want to uh, uh, follow me on social media, probably the best spot is Twitter, where I'm at Nick underscore Bunker. Nick underscore Bunker on Twitter. Yeah. And, and I love, you know, keeping an eye on on the labor market takes and and like it's a really important function for us in housing this year if if people start losing jobs then th- then there are downstream implications of uh for housing demand um and but it, but and conversely everybody's employed right now and 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 so one of the things that is Keeping that—that's keeping a a floor on any housing market, uh, you know, correction because there are people who who are still buying homes, and and we have inventory is tight enough that there mm-hmm. that the affordability problems are, uh, like th- there's few there's they don't have to be affordability, uh, for everybody. It's it's only for the you know a smaller number because there's only a smaller number of homes available for people to buy. It's a really fascinating mm-hmm. uh, time. In that, but but um, you know, assuming enough rates climb and employment uh, unemployment climbs, like those would be uh, uh, th- those are two factors that I'd be watching to to have a housing market resume the down the downturn we saw last fall. Nick, mm-hmm. such such great information. Thank you so much for joining us. Nick Bunker from My Indeed.com and the the Indeed.com hiring lab. So that's hiringlab.org uh, and um everybody this is a top of mind podcast thank you all for joining us again we'll be back in a week or two with uh, more more data on the, the housing market thanks everybody thanks for listening to top of mind see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes